Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. The topic of today's webinar is IFRS 15, the new revenue standard, titled Revenue from Contracts with Customers. However, today's session is not going to be a full in-depth theory session on the detail of the standard, but rather is going to be a recap, a bit of overview or background of the standard, and then also a high-level recap of the five-step model which IFRS 15 has introduced. And the session is rather going to focus on some practical application scenarios to see how the model, how this five-step model is going to work in practice for us to actually see whether or not we are actually ready for when the standard is going to become effective for years starting on or after 1 January 2018. First off, before we do a high-level recap, let's just go through some of the overview or the background of IFRS 15. The standard was released in May 2014, and it was a combined project of both the ISB and the FASB. Within the first few months of the standard being issued, its effective date was actually deferred, so it is currently effective for years starting on or after 1 January 2018. In April 2016, the boards further issued some clarifications to the standard. These clarifications are effective together with the standard for years starting on or after 1 January 2018. Just as a bit of a refresher, IS18, together with all its interpretation guidance included in, for example, IFRIC 13, as well as IS11 dealing with construction contracts, they've been replaced by the new IFRS 15. IS18, if we think about how we used to think about recognizing revenue, there was a separate model for the sale of goods and a separate model for the rendering of services. And depending on whether or not you were selling a good or rendering service, that was going to drive or dictate how an entity was going to go about recognizing their revenue. Everest 15 has now replaced both of these thoughts of models with a single model, the five-step model. And the focus is actually going to be on when control is going to pass to the customer. Let us just do a quick recap of what the scope requirements of IFRS 15 are. IFRS 15 is known as a residual standard. So in other words, an entity is required to consider a contract or an arrangement that they have with a counterparty in terms of any other standard or other applicable accounting guidance before they turn to IFRS 15. Only should a contract or arrangement not fall within the scope of any other accounting standard, then are they going to look to IFRS 15 for guidance. Now let us just consider what is the five-step model that has been introduced by IFRS 15. What's necessary to remember is that this five-step model needs to be applied in all contracts with customers, irrespective of whether you are selling a good or rendering a service or building a house for your customer. And it is also necessary to go through the five-step model in order. It is necessary to go through step one, two, three, four, five to ensure that you have identified the deliverables properly, to also ensure that you have determined your transaction price appropriately and made the correct allocation between your identified deliverables, to ensure that you are recognizing revenue in the correct amount and at the correct time whether it be over time or at a point in time. The first step of the five-step model requires an entity to identify the contract with the customer. So step one provides us with the definition of what is a contract and what is the definition of our customer. In addition, step one provides us with guidance, which needs to be considered when you're determining who is acting as principal or an agent in a relationship or an arrangement. So you could, be, you could have a situation where somebody is providing a service on behalf of somebody else. There are then indicators listed in the standard which you need to consider to determine whether or not an entity is acting as a principal and they are ultimately responsible for delivering that good or service to the customer, in other words, entitling them to recognize revenue and costs on a gross basis, or whether or not they are acting as agent, in other words, they are acting on behalf of the principal and therefore they are then only entitled to recognize revenue as a net amount, being a representation of the commission or the margin which they are entitled to receive. Further guidance contained in step one deals with contract modifications. So a contract modification is a situation where there might be a change to the contract term subsequent to inception, where there is actually a change in the price or in the scope of what is going to be delivered in terms of the contract. There are different outcomes or there's different ways in which a modification is going to be accounted for in terms of step one, depending on what is added. So in other words, if there is additional deliverables which are being promised to the customer and also as to how those deliverables are being priced. Step one also contains guidance with regards to contract combination. There could be situations where an entity is entering into more than one contract with the same customer or with a related party to that customer at or near the same time. And it might be necessary for an entity then to combine those contracts under IFRS 15 and to consider those multiple agreements as a single contract for purposes of considering the remaining four steps of the five-step model. Step two is the step which is potentially going to create the greatest gray hairs for a lot of entities. 
And this is the step which is requiring an entity to identify what are the performance obligations. So the word performance obligation is just a fancy way of saying it's necessary to identify what are the promises which are being made in terms of the contract. So in other words, what is the entity promising to deliver to their customer in terms of the arrangement? It is necessary to identify what is a distinct performance obligation. And we're going to consider this in somewhat more detail as we go through the practical scenarios we consider as part of this webinar. Step three then requires an entity to determine the transaction price. So in other words, an entity needs to determine what is the total pot of consideration they are entitled to receive in exchange for delivering what they have identified in terms of step two. Guidance is contained in the standard to, put, to tell an entity how do they go about accounting for contracts where there's variability in the transaction price. So for example, the transaction price might make uh, might give the customer uh, an ability to, to get a volume rebate should they purchase over a certain limit. Also, there could be contingent consideration. There could be rights of returns. Those are all aspects which give rise to some variability in the transaction price. In addition, there's also guidance contained in step three dealing with financing components. So for example, where an entity provides or sells goods or services to a customer on deferred payment terms, how does that need to be accounted for in terms of IFRS 15? Both of these two aspects of variable consideration as well as financing components we'll consider later on uh, when we are going through some of the practical scenarios. In addition, step three, there is additional guidance provided for non-cash consideration, so if you have a barter transaction, and also for situations where an entity might find themselves having to make a payment to their customer. So once we've determined our deliverables in terms of step two and our total pot of consideration in terms of step three, it is then necessary to allocate what we've determined in step three across our performance obligations identified in step two. So should we only have identified a single performance obligation in terms of step two, step four is not going to be relevant because the total transaction price determined in step three is going to be recognized as that performance obligation in terms of step two is then delivered. However, should you identify multiple performance obligations in terms of step two, the amount which you've determined in step three needs to be allocated to those performance obligations relative to the standalone selling price of those performance obligations identified in step two. There is only the single means in which to allocate your transaction price, which is allowed in terms of IFRS 15. So once we've determined our deliverables, our transaction price, and we've appropriately allocated our transaction price to our deliverables, only in step five do we then go through an exercise of determining when do we recognize revenue. Revenue is going to be recognized when control of the performance obligation is going to be transferred to the customer. There are three criteria contained in the standard which an entity needs to consider first to determine whether or not they satisfy the requirements to recognize revenue over time. It is only if they do not satisfy any of those criteria that they then result in recognizing revenue at a point in time. This is also going to be considered as part of the practical scenarios which we then work through. There is also other guidance contained in IFRS 15 which we do not touch on as part of today's session. For example, there is guidance specifically dealing with entities who are providing or they provide licensing of intellectual property to their customers. There is a separate model which is then going to be applicable to them for recognizing revenue. There is also additional guidance which is provided for costs which an entity incurs to obtain a contract or costs which an entity incurs which is going to help them better fulfill their obligations in terms of the agreement. Other guidance contained deals with what is the presentation and disclosure requirements and like all new standards there are certain transitional uh, provisions which we then also need to consider. Both of these of which we are going to then look at towards the end of today's webinar. What we are going to do now is we are going to consider three practical scenarios and as part of these scenarios we are going to go back to the guidance which is contained in IFRS 15 to see how the requirements of IFRS 15 are going to play out in practice. The first scenario we are going to consider is going to deal with a telco. The fact pattern is as follows. Let's assume that on the 1st of January, a telco enters into a 24-month contract with a customer in terms of which the customer is going to receive the following. They are going to receive a handset, as well as a 24-month network service subscription contract. The price per the contract is as follows. The handset is priced at $100, and the monthly services are priced at $50 a month. The standalone selling price of the separate components, the handset has a standalone selling price of $500 and the services are at $40 a month. The payment details per the contract is that the customer is required to pay up front for the handset and they're going to pay evenly or monthly over the 24 month period for the network services which they're going to receive. 
further to the fact pattern it says that it is customary business practice in the industry for a customer to call at any time after the 22nd month of their contract to request an upgrade or a contract renewal. Usually these contracts can be upgraded or renewal can be entered into at any point in time after the 22nd month without the customer being charged an early termination fee. And history shows on average customers upgrade or renew their contracts at month 23 of their signed 24 month contracts. Additional information or there's a note at the bottom of the slide which states that a customer can bring their own handset and into a SIM card contract only. There are a few things which then we now need to consider as a result of this fact pattern. We need to consider what are the performance obligations. Secondly, what is the transaction price? Then also how should the transaction price be allocated to the determined performance obligations? And further, what is going to happen when the customer phones up in month 23 to either request for renewal or to upgrade their telephone or their subscription contract? The first thing we are going to consider is what are the performance obligations in terms of this contract? This is requiring us to look at step two of the five step model. We are told as part of the fact pattern that a customer could bring their own handsets and enter into a SIM contract only. Before we consider what that means in terms of our fact pattern, let's just go back to what the requirements or what the guidance of step two in terms of IFRS 15 is. IFRS 15 requires an entity to identify their performance obligations and in particular to identify performance obligations which are distinct. A performance obligation is going to be distinct when it meets two criteria. The first criteria or the first question you need to ask yourself is, can the customer benefit from the good or service on its own or together with other resources which are readily available to the customer? And the second criterion is, is the obligation to transfer a good or service separately identifiable from other promises in the contract? And this requires a little bit more judgment to be involved because this requires an entity to consider three factors. For example, does the entity provide a service of integrating the promised goods or services into a bundle which represents the combined output? Or does one or more of the goods or services promised to the customer modify or customize other goods or services promised in terms of the contract? Or are the goods or services highly interdependent or highly interrelated with other promised goods or services in the contract? So in our fact pattern, it says that the customer is contracting to receive both a handset as well as network services. But we're also told that it is possible that a customer didn't have to come to contract to receive the handset. They can also just come to their telco to actually enter into a network service contract only. So this kind of tells me if I consider the two criteria indicated on the slide, that it is likely that the handset as well as the network services meet both of those two criteria. For example, the customer can benefit from the network services on its own or with resources that it readily has. If a customer already has a handset, then it's possible that they can then use these network services together with the resource that it already has, being the handset. And in the second criteria, is the, is the network services and the handset separately identifiable? There is no evidence that the entity or that the telco is integrating the handset and the network services into a combined output, nor does the network services customize or modify the handset or vice versa, nor is there evidence that the functionality of the handset and the network services are highly interdependent or highly interrelated with one another. So based on the simple fact pattern, we should all come to the conclusion that there are two performance obligations identified, that there is the handset as well as the network service contract. The next thing we need to consider is what is the transaction price? This is asking us to consider step three of the five step model. So if we just remind ourselves of what the fact pattern stated, it says that the customer is agreeing to receive a handset as well as a 24 month contract to receive network services. The price per the contract stated that the handset was at $100 and that the network services were priced at $50 per month. This seems relatively straightforward. This means that the handset charged at $100 and the network services, the total consideration which is going to be received in terms of the contract is $50 per month, so $50 times 24 months, that comes to an amount of $1,200. Therefore, isn't it quite simple that the total transaction price is the sum of the $100 for the handset, the $1,200 for the network services, meaning that the total consideration is actually $1,300. 
but we need to bear in mind that there was a clause which stated all that's customary business practice that a customer could call at any point in time after month 22 to request for an upgrade or to renew their contract. Does that now bear any impact on the determination of my transaction price? I mentioned earlier when we did a high-level recap of the five-step model that step one provided guidance as to how do you go about accounting for a modification to your contract. Remember, a modification is only where there has been a change in the scope or the price or both subsequent to the inception of the contract. But we were told in terms of the fact pattern that it is customary business practice and that every customer knows when they enter into their contract with the telco that they are entitled or they have the, the right to call at any point after month 22 to either renew their contract or to upgrade to another contract. So if I consider, has there been a change in the scope or the pricing of the contract subsequent to inception? And the answer should be no, because a customer has a right from contract inception to make that call after month 22 to renew or upgrade. So the question is, what do I then do? Or how do I then take this so-called 22 to 24 month contract duration into account when I'm determining my transaction price? What this gives rise to is actually variability in my transaction price. The guidance in terms of step three of IFRS 15 states that if there is consideration that it is, and, and it is variable, an entity needs to estimate that variable component upfront. So in other words, an entity cannot wait until month 23 of the 24 month contract to see whether or not there needs to be an adjustment made to the amount of revenue which they've recognized. There are different ways in which an entity could go about determining or estimating what is the variable component of their transaction price. So either an entity could consider what is the range of possible outcomes. So this could involve the sum of probability weighted amounts. So it's an expected value approach. Or they could look at what is the most likely amount that is going to result from this variable component. Once an entity has determined or has estimated what the variable component of their transaction price is, they are only going to include it in their transaction price from contract inception if it is highly probable that there is not going to be a significant revenue reversal at a later point in time. If we go back to our fact pattern that we had, Given the fact that from contract inception, both parties know that the customer has the ability to make a call after 22 months to request an upgrade or a renewal, and on average, history shows that customers typically make these decisions at month 23, this actually indicates that a contract is not actually 24 months in duration, but rather 23 months in duration, if we were taking into account the guidance of the variable consideration. So as indicated on the slide, the, the contract price for the handset remains at $100. However, the network services, we would not include in our transaction price at contract inception 24 months of consideration, but rather we would include 23 months of consideration because customary business practice indicates that customers typically upgrade their contracts at month 23 of their 24 month uh, contract which means that if we were to consider on day one, what is the total consideration that an entity is going to receive over the life or the duration of this contract, it is in fact actually the $50 over 23 months rather than 24 months. Thus my transaction price that I'm going to determine in step three is not $1,300, but rather is $1,250. What happens though, is at the end of each reporting period or at the end of the 23 months, it's necessary for the entity to reassess or to re-estimate the variable consideration. Facts might change or circumstances might change and it might, there might be reason to believe that a customer is going to continue up until their 24, the 24th month of their contract. And this could then require for an entity to then go back and recalculate the revenue that they've recognized to date as there may be an adjustment then to the total transaction price subsequent to contract inception. The next question we need to consider is, how should this transaction price be allocated to the identified performance obligations? This, so this is now looking at step four of the five-step model. There is a single means in which a transaction price can be allocated to identified performance obligations. The requirements of IFRS 15 requires an entity to allocate the transaction price on the basis of the relative standalone selling prices for each performance obligation. 
So if we just consider the example as indicated on the slide, let's assume in this fact pattern there are three performance obligations which have been identified in step two. Performance obligations are A, B, and C. If A were to be sold separately, it's going to be sold for $9. If B was going to be sold separately, it would sell for $11. And if C was going to be sold separately, it would be sold for $20. Thus, a normal customer in normal circumstances might walk into the store, and if they were to put A, B, and C into their basket, they would be paying a total of $40 for A, B, and C. However, let's assume in this scenario that an entity decides to grant the customer a discount of 10% because they've purchased all three goods together. So this means that, in the end, that the customer is only paying $36 rather than $40 for the three promised goods. So how do I then go allocating this 10% discount? So either you could go and apply a 10% discount factor to each of the selling prices of A, B, and C, or you can follow the formulas indicated on the slide. We are going to take $36, and you're going to multiply it by, in the case of A, it would be 9 over 40, 9 being the standalone selling price of A, and 40 representing the sum of the standalone selling prices of the goods which have been sold as part of this contract. This is going to result in revenue being allocated to A of $8.10, B $9.90, and C, $18. This allocation method has to is going to be applied irrespective as to how an entity prices or sells their contract to the customer. So this is irrespective of the fact that the supplier might have gone to the customer and said, in this scenario indicated on the slide, A is $9, B is $11, and C, we will sell it to you for 16 if A, B, and C have been sold together to the customer as part of a single contract, and if they've been identified as three separate performance obligations in step two, step four requires us, irrespective of how it has been priced to the customer, that discount has to be allocated proportionately relative to the standalone selling prices of the promised goods in terms of that contract. So if we apply that principle to our fact pattern, we know that the stand, we are told the standalone selling price of the handset is $500, and we are told that the standalone selling price for network services is $40 per month. So $40 per month times 24, combined with the $500 for the handset, that amounts to a total or the sum of the standalone selling prices being $1,460. If we had to determine the ratio, so what is the allocation between the handset and the network services, it is going to amount to an allocation of 34% of the handset, that's being the $500 divided by the $1,460, and an allocation of 66% of the network services, that's being the $960 over the $1,460. So in the previous question, we determined what is our total transaction price. That was $1,250. We then multiply the $1,250 by those ratios, which we've now determined, being 34% for the handset and 66% for the network services. That results in revenue being allocated to the handset of $425 and allocated to the network services of $825. We have not addressed step five as part of the scenario, but step five was going to ask us or, or ask us to look at or to consider when do we get to recognize revenue. We can assume in this case at handset we are going to recognize revenue at a point in time. That would result then in $425 being recognized when control of the handset is passed to the customer. And we're going to assume that the network services, that that revenue is going to be recognized over time. Bear in mind that we've said that for purposes of recognizing the revenue, the contract is 23 months. So therefore, we are going to recognize $825 evenly over the 23-month contract period. The only other thing we need to consider is what is the accounting treatment required if the customer calls to upgrade their contract at month 23. Given the fact that we considered 23 months has actually been the contract duration for purposes of determining my transaction price and as part of step 3, there is actually going to be no accounting consequence when the customer then calls at month 23 to upgrade their contract. Should, however, the customer call at month 22 or month 24, there might be a slight adjustment which could be required to be made to the amount of revenue that has been recognized as a result of revenue being now accounted for as a 23-month contract. That brings an end to the first practical scenario which we were considering. Let us now consider the second scenario. The scenario deals with a construction contract who has entered into a contract to design and build a train station. 
the land is going to be owned, or let's assume that in our fact pattern that the land is owned by the customer. The construction company is going to be responsible for the design and the overall management of the build, which includes the drawings, the design, engineering, site preparation, the laying down of foundations, construction of the station, and the installation of all peripherals, including things such as access gates, bathrooms, power station, etc. It is anticipated that the construction is going to take 36 months to complete. In order to complete the project, the construction company needs to obtain specialized equipment from Subco, so in other words, from a subcontractor. And this equipment would need to be integrated into the completed train station. The subcontractor is the only party who can perform this integration, and it could take up to a year in, to actually complete this integration process. Contract Co. has to make an upfront payment for the cost of the specialized equipment before the subcontract will begin construction of the said equipment. The contract provides for the following payment terms. 10% of the contract price has to be paid for upon the signing of the contract and this amount is non-refundable. 40% is then payable after 12 months and 50% is payable upon customer acceptance at the completion of the project. In addition, the second and third payments would be adjusted by 1% for each week that the project is delayed. So in other words, there are performance milestones which have to be met in terms of the contract. The construction company has no prior experience with the said customer, nor has it got any access to any credit rating records for the said customer. The customer is a newly incorporated entity in the region, and it is still in the process of applying for bank financing from a local bank. We are then further told that approval for the financing is only obtained three months after the contract has been signed. From this fact pattern, there are further a few questions which we need to consider. The first one, do we actually have a contract with our customer? Secondly, how do I account for the 10% payment I've received up front, which is also then non-refundable? Thirdly, what are the performance obligations? What is the transaction price? And how does the construction company go about recognizing revenue? FS15 indicates that there are five criteria which have to be met in order for there to be a contract with a customer as required in terms of step one. The contract needs to be approved, which needs to be approved by both parties and the parties committed to performing their respective obligations. Each party's rights regarding the goods or services to be transferred needs to be identified. Payment terms need to be identified. The contract needs to have commercial substance. And the fifth one requires an entity con to consider or to, to conclude that it is probable that the entity is going to collect the consideration to which it is entitled to as and when those amounts fall due. So in other words, it's requiring an entity to consider the customer's intention and the ability to make payments as, as and when amounts fall due. So given the fact pattern that we had, it is the fifth criterion which might cause us to have doubt as to whether or not we actually have a contract um, as required in terms of the five-step model, because we are told in the fact pattern the following. We are told that Construction Co. has no prior experience with the customer, nor has it got any access to any credit rating or records for the customer. The customer is newly incorporated and is still in the process of obtaining financing. So if we have to consider that criterion, can we conclude that the customer is able and actually has the intention to make payments as and when they fall due? It is unlikely upon the signing of the contract that a supplier or that the construction company is going to say that they've met that fifth requirement. In all likelihood, they're going to say they've only met the requirements of, of a, there being a contract with a customer three months after the contract has been signed at the point in time when the bank financing has actually been obtained and approved. Because the construction company will probably only then conclude to say that it is probable that they are going to collect the consideration as and when it falls due. Because by the bank approving the financing, it is now clear that the customer actually has the intention and the ability to pay as and when amounts fall due in terms of the contract. So if we are saying that we only have a contract in terms of if it's 15 at month 3 once the bank financing has been approved, how do we then account for the 10% payment that is non-refundable and that has been received at the point of time in which the contract has been signed? Where a contract with a customer does not meet the criteria as required in terms of step one of the model, and an entity receives the payment from a customer, the entity recognizes that consideration received as a liability. The liability represents the entity's obligation either to transfer goods or services in the future or to refund the payment received. In either case, the liability is going to be measured at the amount of consideration that has been received. In this scenario, we are, however, told that the amount is non-refundable, 
This does not, however, mean that the amount can be recognized as revenue, as, as even though that the construction company would never be in a position to have to repay the amount to the customer. The requirements of the standard says that the construction company can only recognize that 10% amount as revenue either when they have no remaining performance obligations, so that's assuming that the criteria of a contract are met, and based on the assessment as to when the control of the performance obligation passes to the customer, so in other words, going through step one, two, three, four, five of the model, or if the contract is then terminated, so in other words, when the construction company has no remaining performance obligations. It is only at that point in time then that, that then con the construction company is entitled to recognize that amount which they have received as revenue. So the next thing we need to consider is what are the identified performance obligations in terms of this contract. This is just a, the same slide that was indicated earlier. So these are the two criteria which need to be met in identifying or determining whether or not we have a distinct performance obligation. So remember, the first thing we need to consider is whether or not the customer can benefit from the good or service on their own or together with other resources that are readily available to them. And the second question we need to look at is whether or not the goods or services are separately identifiable from other promises in the contract. It is the second criterion in this case which is going to require judgment to be involved and which is going to be more relevant in the determination or the assessment of what is a distinct performance obligation in this fact pattern. The construction company would likely account for this project as a single performance obligation because they would probably reach the conclusion that these various uh, goods or services which are going to be provided are not going to meet the two criterion of being distinct. The elements of the train station are highly interrelated and highly interdependent on one another and a contract includes a significant service of integrating the various goods or services into the combined item for which the customer has contracted to receive. In other words, the customer has contracted to receive a functioning train station rather than multiple deliverables, for example, of 10,000 bricks, 3,000 bags of cement. The fact that the construction company has to subcontract an element does not detract from this above conclusion. The procurement and installation of the specialized equipment would not amount to it being a separate performance obligation, as the specialized equipment still has to be integrated into the rest of the project to actually provide the customer with the combined output being the train station for which they have contracted to receive. We are told that the the construction company is going to provide the design and build of a train station. And although you could see or there could be an argument to break it down into drawings, designs, engineering and site preparation, so for example to break it down into its separate components, we need to consider from the customer's perspective what is it that the customer has contracted to receive. And as I've said previously, it is evident from the fact pattern they have contracted to receive a completed train station. So we need to consider when we are trying to determine whether or not we have multiple performance obligations or a single performance obligation, you need to ask yourself, is the supplier capable of delivering these variable components independently of other goods or services which have been promised in the contracts? This step is going to require judgment and the boards acknowledged when they first released the standard as well as part of the clarifications to the standard, they acknowledge that there is going to be judgment which management or which an entity is going to have to apply in determining what are distinct performance obligations in a contract. The next thing we need to consider is what is the transaction price. Similar to when we were looking at step three in the first scenario dealing with the telco, there is variability in the transaction price in this construction contract. The contract makes provision for there to be late performance penalties. So we are told if at certain points of time on the contract there is late delivery or the, the milestones haven't been met in terms of the contract, there is going to be a 1% adjustment to the amount which is going to be payable by the customer. This is a form of variable consideration. So as we discussed previously, management or the entity, the construction company is going to have to estimate the amount in which they think they're going to be entitled to. So they're going to have to estimate what is the chances or the probability of them actually being late and by how many weeks do they anticipate to being late in determining what is this variable component of their transaction price. So as we've mentioned earlier, 
there's two ways in which the management of the construction company could estimate this variable component. Either they could use the expected value approach, so in other words, look at the probability weighted of these variable amounts, or they could determine what is the most likely amount which is going to result or is going to outcome uh, if they were to consider previous trends, uh, past practice or past contracts that they've had with similar customers and similar circumstances, etc. Whether or not an entity decides to use the range of possible outcomes or a single most likely amount, that is not in itself an accounting policy choice. Management needs to determine for each contract when they are determining or estimating what the variable component is, what is the most appropriate method for estimating the variable component. It could differ between different contracts. Further, given the fact that this contract could take 36 months in which to complete and there are various points between the contract when payment is going to be made by the customer, it is also necessary for us to consider whether or not there is a significant financing component which needs to be taken into account. So just as a refresher, we are all quite familiar with when a customer is provided with deferred payment terms that we need to go and consider whether or not the impact of discounting or determining the present value of, of those amounts, whether there is a material financing component. Under IFRS 15, it acknowledges that it might not only be the customer who is provided with the benefit of financing. Payment terms of a contract could be set up such that it is the entity or, for example, the construction company which might receive the benefit of financing depending on how the, the payment terms are actually structured in terms of the arrangement. There are some practical expedients where there may be evidence of there being a financing component, but when an entity actually can ignore the existence of a financing component, for example, if the time difference between the date of performance and the date of payments is less than 12 months. However, just bear in mind that IFRS 15 does state it's necessary to take into account a significant financing component if either party is provided with the benefit of financing by the way in which the, the, the payment terms of the contract have been set up. So the last thing we need to consider is how we are going to recognize revenue. In other words, are we going to recognize revenue over time or are we going to have to recognize revenue at a point in time? Before we consider our fact pattern, let's just do a recap of what the criteria or the requirements of IFRS 15 are. IFRS 15 requires us to first consider three criteria to determine whether or not we qualify to recognize revenue over time. It is only if we do not meet any of those three criteria do we then recognize revenue at a point in time. The first criterion or the first question we need to consider is, does the customer receive the benefits as an entity performs and no other entity would need to reperform that work? This first criterion is to capture your typical service type contracts today. So for example, if somebody's rendering with your cleaning service today, if for some reason the agreement comes to an end tomorrow, nobody else needs to come in and reperform the cleaning service that was provided on the previous day. And also the customer is receiving the benefit as and when the entity performing the cleaning service is actually rendering that service. So in those cases, you would still qualify to recognize revenue over time. The second criterion asks us to consider, does the entity's performance create or enhance an asset that the customer controls? So the second criterion is to capture your typical construction type contracts today. So IS 11, which deals with construction contracts today, says that an entity is going to recognize revenue over time. So if we consider this criteria in terms of IFRS 15, for example, if a construction company is going to construct something on land which the customer already controls, ownership of whatever they affix to the land is going to pass to the customer as and when the entity performs or as and when it obviously affixes those deliverables to the land owned by the customer. So in those cases, you're still going to recognize revenue over time. The third criterion in terms of IFRS 15 requires an entity to consider two things. Is the entity creating an asset that has no alternative use? So, for example, there could be a contractual restriction that an entity cannot do anything else with that asset, or it could be due to the nature of the asset where practically the asset has no alternative use. And the second element of that criterion is, does the entity have a right to payment for work to date? So in this case, you need to go and determine, does an entity have a right to be reimbursed for all costs that they have incurred, plus a reasonable margin, at all points of time throughout the contract? If those, criteria, if, that, if those two criteria are met, then again the entity is going to qualify to recognize revenue over time. Only if an entity has not met any of those three criteria are they then going to result in recognizing revenue at a point in time. It is then necessary to ascertain what is the point in time at which they are then entitled to recognize revenue.
So if we consider our current fact pattern, we are most likely going to meet the second criterion. So we are saying that the construction company, as and when the construction company is performing, because the customer controlled the land, ownership is going to pass, or ownership of the work in progress is going to pass to the customer as the construction company is performing. In that case, the, the construction company is going to qualify to recognize revenue over time. An appropriate measure of progress towards complete satisfaction would then need to be determined. An output measure or an input measure could be used. And the guidance contained in IFRS 15 with regards to your measures of progress is similar to that which we have today. The measure elected should be the best measure which is going to depict the transfer of control to the customer. It is necessary to bear in mind, because the fact pattern provided for certain milestone payments, that there could be a difference between the amount which is physically received by the construction company and that which is recognized as revenue. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that because I've received an amount in cash that I'm now qualified to recognize that as revenue. There was also, also contained in the fact pattern, it indicated there was amounts that the construction company was going to have to pay up front to obtain that specialized equipment. It is necessary to just bear in mind at this point that there is specific guidance dealing with uninstalled materials in IFRS 15. Uninstalled materials are materials acquired by a contractor that are going to be used by the contractor to satisfy its performance obligations for which a cost in, for which when the cost incurred it does not actually depict a transfer of any control to the customer. So for example, construction company paid in advance, however by the mere fact that they've made payment does not mean that there's been any additional performance which has actually been transferred or delivered to the, the customer in this case. So therefore, should an input measure be used as a measure of progress, so for example, comparing what is total costs incurred to date in relation to the total estimated costs expected to be incurred in the completion of the contract, the cost of this uninstalled material should be excluded from the measure of progress and should only be included upon the transfer of control to the customer. We are now going to move on to the third scenario, or to the third practical application of IFRS 15. Instead of one large fact pattern in this case, we are going to consider some different scenarios. Firstly, the first scenario says, in each vehicle sale transactional agreement, Toyota sells or they include a standard warranty which is going to protect the customer against a latent or against latent defects. At the date of the sales transaction, the customer has a further option to purchase an additional or an extended warranty to provide them with additional protection. So if we had to consider the requirements of IFRS 15, there should be some light bulbs going off to consider, has, the, has Toyota agreed to actually deliver something additional to the customer by providing them with a warranty? IFRS 15, if we consider step two when we're determining whether, what are distinct performance obligations, you would not result in identifying a separate performance obligation in the case of there being a standard warranty against latent defects provided to a customer. So the way in which you account for a, a standard warranty today under current guidance is going to continue under IFRS 15. So there's no separate performance obligation identified and the guidance of IS 37, which deals with your, your provisions and contingent liabilities, etc., that guidance is going to have to be considered in actually raising a provision warranty. However, in the case of there being an extended warranty, this might give rise to an, extended, an additional performance obligation, which is then going to require some portion of the transaction price to then be allocated to that. So in the case where there is an extended or an additional warranty over and above a warranty to protect the customer against latent defects, this could give rise to an additional distinct performance obligation in step two of the five-step model. So if this is relevant to you, just bear this in mind, because this is then going to have a roll-on effect when you get to step four of the five-step model, as you're now going to be required to allocate a part of your transaction price between your identified deliverables. And this could then also have an impact at the timing and the amount of revenue recognized in terms of step five. Let's consider the second little fact pattern that we have. A retailer sells 100 widgets for $100 each. The widgets cost $50, and the terms of the sale include a right of return, so a customer has the ability to return these widgets within 30 days. The retailer estimates that 10 widgets will be returned based on historical sales patterns. And in establishing this estimate, the re retailer uses an expected value method and estimates a 40% probability that 8 widgets will be returned, a 45% probability that 9 widgets will be returned, and a 15% probability that 18 widgets will be returned. <laughs> 
So some light bulb should be going at this stage to say that this is dealing with variable consideration. Variable consideration, remember, requires us to estimate what is the variable component of my transaction price. And by mean, by the customer having a right of return, that is giving rise to some variability. Because the entity cannot say, or the retailer cannot say on day one, that they're selling 100 widgets, that therefore they're going to recognize 100 times $100 as their revenue. We are also told that the entity is applying an expected value method in estimating the amount of variable, or the variable component of their consideration, which means that they are then going to look at a weighted average of the 40% probability, 45% probability, and the 15% probability of the various numbers of widgets which are expected to be returned. So what is the accounting treatment which is required in the case of where you have a right of return? So the standard provides specific guidance in these cases. It says that an entity should only recognize revenue for those widgets where they do not expect to be returned. So without it, it's not indicated on the slide, but if the customer considered or if, if the retailer considered what is the probability or, or the, the percentage which is going to be returned, we are told that it was 10 widgets based on the 45% probability, 40% probability, etc. So therefore, only 90 of the 100 widgets do we actually expect to be sold for which we now can recognize revenue. So therefore, revenue is going to be recognized at $9,000, being $1,000 I mean times 90 widgets. And at the same time, we are then going to record the cost of sales associated to the sale of those 90 widgets. So we are told the costs are $50 for 90 widgets, means we're recognizing a cost of $4,500. What we need to do, though, is we also now need to recognize the anticipated return of widgets. So we need to raise an asset on our books because we would have de-recognized the inventory upon the so-called sale. However, we are not de-recognizing them completely because we are anticipating 10 widgets to be returned. So therefore, we need to raise an asset in the amount of 1,000, being the $100 selling price times the 10 widgets we expect to be returned. At the same time, we also need to recognize a liability because the retailer could have received the full payment in cash of $100 for 100 widgets. However, we anticipate that we are going to have to make a payment to the customer for 10 widgets. So therefore, we raise a liability for the anticipated return of these widgets for $1,000, being $100 times 10 widgets. Should the 30-day period lapse and obviously these widgets not being returned, then there could be the derecognition of the asset and the liability and then the associated cost and the associated revenue amount then needs to be recognized. So the next part of our practical scenario three. Tradeco sells goods for $100,000. As part of the sale, though, Tradeco provides the customer with a voucher entitling them to a 60% discount or future purchases, only purchases that they then make within the next 90 days. Tradeco, however, intends to offer a 10% discount on all sales as part of a promotional contain to all customers during the same 90-day period. And management estimates that 75% of customers that receive this voucher entitling them to the 60% discount will make use of this voucher. What this a discount that has been granted to the customer, it provides what is known as a material right. So the discount represents a material right which is going to be identified as a separate performance obligation in terms of step two, if we were to consider the guidance of the standard. Because they said in this case, there are two deliverables which are actually being provided to the customer, the goods which are being sold for $100,000, but at the same time, the customer is receiving a right to purchase goods at a discounted price in the future. The same as if you were receiving a, a mile, uh, if you've bought an air ticket and you're getting air miles. You are receiving the ticket to the right to fly currently as well as a, a right to receive a discounted or a free flight at the, in the future. So because we're identifying more than one deliverable in terms of step two, it is going to be necessary to allocate some of the transaction price to the two deliverables. So therefore, the 100,000 selling price is going to need to be allocated between the goods which are being sold today, as well as this material right which is being offered. There is going to be some estimation or there's going to be some judgment which you are going to have to take into account when determining what is the standalone selling price of this material right for purposes of allocating the transaction price in terms of step four. What we need to bear in mind was a bit of a catch in the scenario. It says that all customers are going to receive a 10% discount. So in other words, if we had to work out what is the actual discount that the customer uh, for the goods which are being sold for 100,000, what are they actually receiving? It is in fact actually only a 50% discount. Because of the fact that every customer 
even without entering into that first transaction, they are going to be entitled to a 10% discount. So the additional benefit which that first customer is being entitled to is actually only a 50% discount. So therefore, in determining what is the standalone selling price, you are going to take into account what is the value of this discount. So you're going to take into account what is the typical amount that a person is going to spend. But it's also necessary to take into account the 75% or the fact that only 75% of customers are expected to actually exercise that right and to actually make use of that 50% discount. So our last little scenario which we're looking at as part of this practical scenario three, it says an entity incurs various costs in order to secure a million dollar contract with a customer. The contract is going to give rise to a million rands worth of revenue, which is going to be recognized over the duration of the contract, which we are told is 18 months. The following costs were incurred by the entity. There were proposal preparation costs of $2,000, sales staff commission of $5,000, and certain equipment which was purchased, which is going to be used in satisfying the performance obligations of $25,000. So IFRS 15 contains specific guidance, which we did not have under current guidance today in terms of IS 18, dealing with your contract costs. It acknowledges that there are two types of contract costs. There is a contract acquisition cost. So this could be a cost that an entity is going to incur in acquiring a contract. What the standard then requires, it states that if that cost is incremental to requiring the contract, so in other words, that cost could have been avoided had that contract not been obtained, and if that cost is going to be recovered through the transaction price which is being charged to the customer, in that case, those contract acquisition costs are required to be capitalized. So in other words, an asset is going to be recognized on the statement of financial position. And then those costs need to be amortized over the duration of the contract. Note that there is a practical expedient which states that if the contract duration is 12 months or less, then it is not necessary to capitalize and amortize that cost. There is a second type of cost which IFRS 15 makes provision for, and this is known as a fulfillment cost. So a fulfillment cost arises in situations where an entity or the supplier might incur certain costs to obtain certain assets or to acquire resources which are then going to be used in the future satisfaction of the performance obligations of the contract. This is then known as a fulfillment cost. It is necessary, however, for an entity to consider guidance contained in other standards to see whether or not this cost or is going to qualify to, for capitalization in terms of another standard. So, for example, an entity might be spending the $25,000 to actually buy a piece of equipment which meets the, the recognition criteria or the definition of property, plant and equipment. In that case, IS-16 is going to apply. You only apply the fulfillment cost guidance in terms of IFRS 15 should no other uh, recognition criteria of any other accounting standard apply. So if we were to consider the costs we were told that an entity is incurring in this fact pattern, they were proposal preparation costs. In these cases, these costs are going to be expensed. And the reason why is because a proposal preparation cost is not incremental. That cost would have been incurred irrespective of whether or not the entity obtained the contract. The second cost was the sales staff commission. In these cases, you could argue that this cost was not going to have been paid if it were not for actually acquiring the contract. So in these cases, these are going to be capitalized as contract acquisition costs, and they're going to be amortized over the duration of the contract. What's necessary to bear in mind here that although we were told that the contract duration is 18 months, it is also necessary to take into account any possible contract extensions or contract renewals when we are determining what is the appropriate amortization period. The last cut we were told is that an entity or well, the entity purchased equipment which is going to be used in satisfying the performance obligations of the contract of $25,000. This equipment may qualify to be capitalized under other standards, for example, IS-16. If the cost is not capitalized under any other standard, then it should be capitalized as a fulfillment cost under IFRS 15, provided that it relates to this contract which has been acquired and that this resource is going to be used by the entity in satisfying the future performance obligations under this contract. The same like your contract acquisition costs, it is necessary for this cost to be amortized over the contract period, taking into account as well any extensions or any renewals. Also, the practical expedient is available in this case that where if the contract duration is less than 12 months, then that contract cost does not need to be, be capitalized and amortized, rather it can be expensed in the same period.
So I'm hoping that not only through the discussions that we've just had on those three fact patterns that you've actually started to question whether or not you are in a position where you could say that you are ready for Ephraim 15 to become effective, there are some additional things which it's necessary to actually consider or to take into account prior to the standard actually become effective. And one of them is what is the transitional requirements of IFRS 15? So there are two ways in which an entity could adopt IFRS 15. So the first is to apply a full retrospective adoption, or there is a second alternative to know what is to, to apply what is either known as a modified retrospective or a prospective approach. So in terms of the fully retrospective adoption of the standard, this means that an entity needs to go back and retrospectively restate all their comparatives and their prior disclosed information to actually present results in their first year adoption as if IFRS 15 was always the standard which was then in place. In terms of the modified retrospective or what is known as a prospective approach, this means that an entity is then not going to go and restate their comparatives. They would only apply IFRS 15 in their first year adoption and their comparatives are going to continue to be accounted for in terms of whatever accounting framework or guidance they were applying to their revenue contracts uh, prior to IFRS 15 becoming effective. So you might think that this is now going to result in an easier transitional approach than if you were to go fully retrospective. However, it's not seen as a get out of jail free card because the mere fact that you might not be required to restate your comparatives, remember that this is going to bear an impact on the comparability of your disclosures. But there is then additional disclosure which IFRS 15 requires a preparer to then make so that there could be some comparability between the information which is disclosed in the first year of adoption and to its comparatives. Thus, it is necessary for an entity to go through this assessment and to actually consider what is going to be the best approach for actually adopting IFRS 15. Further, what are the disclosure requirements of IFRS 15? This is a very summarized version of what the disclosure and the presentation requirements of IFRS 15 are. The only point we are trying to illustrate at this stage is that you can see that there are way more disclosures which are required under IFRS 15 than under guidance which we have currently today. It is necessary to disaggregate your revenue. So no longer, or it may no longer actually be appropriate to simply just disclose two line items in your notes, indicating revenue from sale of goods and revenue from the rendering of services. It's necessary for the notes to the financials to actually include reconciliations of your contract assets and your contract liabilities. Also details with regarding to your contract costs. What judgments have you taken into account? What is the amortization periods which you have applied? It's also necessary to provide additional detailed disclosure with regards to your performance obligations. How have you identified your performance obligations? Were the judgments involved? When does an entity expect to satisfy their performance obligations? What are the payment terms? Are there rights of returns? Were there warranties which are provided? And also, what is the price which has been allocated to performance obligations which are outstanding at the end of the reporting period? And as you've probably considered or you should have considered through all the stuff that we've mentioned earlier through this webinar, there are a lot of areas in which there's going to be estimates or where there's going to be judgment involved by management. So if we just consider what is the IS1 requirement in terms of preparing your financial statements, it is necessary for management to make disclosure of any significant judgments or areas of estimation uncertainty that they have made in preparing their financial statements. So this alone could give rise to additional disclosures which then need to be prepared or need to be included in your financial statements. So it's necessary for one to also just sit back to actually consider, do you have systems in place today which are actually able to provide you with all this necessary information which needs to then be provided in the disclosures of your financial statements once IFRS 15 is effective? We hope that this webinar has been helpful in not only just providing high-level recap of some of the important changes which have been brought about by IFRS 15, but also providing you with a more practical application of the standard.